talk to you today about a challenge that I faced in my fundraising. And I, I hope it's something that will chime with all of us. It certainly has been a time of challenges and fundraising. Um, and here's my little story. So three years ago, just over three years ago, I quite innocently walked into work. I just started my relatively new job. And it wasn't a good day. <laughs> Overnight, I found out that up until that point, our hospice lottery, big source of income for us, which had been ticking along really rather quite nicely, just over 9,000 members, everyone quite happy. We lost half of our players overnight. Uh, without going too much into the nuts and bolts, effectively what had happened some years before, um, they decided to, the people who were there before me, um, make a great decision about not having our lottery as a subsidiary of the charity, move it into one company. What everyone had kind of forgotten about was that three years later, the bank account associated with that would close, and with it, went every single player who was playing our lottery by standing order. Thank you very much. Um, there's a part of me that can now look back on that time affectionately as standing order crisis gate, um, but it still sends shivers up my spine. So having come into work that day, realising that we were about to be in crisis mode, um, we got to it, that's what we do as fundraisers, we do it every day. So we came up with a plan, we started writing to all those other players that we had lost. We can fix this, we can fix this, that, that'll be alright. And, and we were making some progress with that, but it became pretty clear pretty quickly that we were never going to recover to the point that we were. So we needed to find some new players for our lottery. So we thought, we'll recruit some canvassers, we'll get some people in-house, they can go door to door, that's great. Unless you've tried to recruit canvassers for a lottery, good canvassers are gold dust. And we couldn't find any at that time. We tried, and it just wasn't happening. But not one to give up. Thought, that's great. What we'll do is we'll get one of the agencies in, we'll do a big telephone campaign. No problem, found some money, wrote a business case, took it to my chief exec. Except what had just happened was Channel 4 Dispatches Program in August that summer, which was one of the first insights into what was happening with some agencies working for charities. And it was pretty bad timing on my part, and put all my plans just completely out the window. Not ideal. My trustees, my, certainly my chief exec, normally has quite a high appetite for risk. But for a charity that, either clinically or non-clinically, hadn't used agencies in any way, now is not the time to start. So I thought, okay, right, can't get canvases, can't do this, can't do something. And hanging over all of that was us as a leadership team, me and my clinical directors, looking out at what we do as a hospice, which is care for the terminally ill. And although we see a lot of patients, and we help a lot of families and carers, there was so much more that we could be doing. As a leadership team, we'd set a business plan that meant we wanted to see even more people. We were pushing ourselves as an organization to make sure that everyone who needed access to our care could get it. Seeing more people, means more money coming in. So I had a really big gap to fill. And I had to solve it. So I thought, our lottery, we've been doing what everyone else has been doing. You know, this is, this is what hospices do. We, we get our money this way. How are we going to do it? And actually I thought, we need to do something differently. So what did I know about the people who were, who were supporting us in that way? Luckily, we'd been on the phone to a few of them, probably standing on a crisis gate. Um, quite a few had phoned, and although <coughs> we're a small charity, we can't afford market research, we can talk to people. And what became really clear is that they weren't players. This was facilitated giving. Couldn't ask them to sign up to a regular gift, but they definitely wanted to play a lottery. They, seemed, they were phoning us up saying, 
I'm give, trying to give you money. I'm trying to put it in your bank account and it keeps coming back at me. Why, why can't I donate this money to you? They weren't asking why they weren't in the week and draw every week. So we knew we had members. We didn't have players. So maybe we needed to start talking to them a little bit differently. What I also know about the people who support my hospice is that, lucky as I am, price isn't really a sensitivity where we are. Uh, we run a raffle every year, we charge five pounds a ticket, no one bats an eyelid. Our average donations when they come in are pretty high. We've been testing a few other asks here and there. Our average gift is good. So price wasn't really a problem for us. So we're fundraisers. Why don't we do what fundraisers are really good at and ask for more? Why wasn't anyone else doing this? Everyone plays the lottery at a pound a week. Why don't we do two <laughs> and see what happens? And that really appealed to my chief exec and my trustees who normally have that really big appetite for risk because they accepted that if we were going to see more people as an organization, something pretty fundamental would need to change on the other side. So I've managed to get them to agree it. We're making this decision, and they wanted it to happen quickly. I had three months to turn around a product and contact everyone who was still a member of that lottery and get them to move up to two pounds. And there's nothing like a tight deadline to focus your resource. Um, anyone who works at a, at a kind of small to medium sized charity, I'm sure will understand. There's not a lot of fat in a fundraising team. What little resource we have is pretty busy every day. But we threw everything we could at it. We came up with a plan, we set ourselves hard targets, and we knew what we needed to do in that short period of time. Um, so we got, we, yeah, set everything up, knew what we were doing, taking it forward. Everything is set, and there isn't hope in fundraising. And I hope that's not too disparaging a message, but there isn't. Because like most things in life, and I'm a big fan of an 80-20 rule, fundraising also is 80-20. 20% 20 inspiration, 80% perspiration. I would ban the word hope for my fundraising team if I could. <laughs> not sure they'd like that very much. But I don't want, don't want them to hope that their targets are come, going to come in. I want them to make it happen. And that's what we did. So we launched a campaign. We got um, our really strong, well thought out messages to all those members now of our lottery, talking to them differently. And we made it happen. We got on the phone. We, we talked to even more supporters than we already had. And we made that change come through to fruition. It was a lot of work, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but it was exactly what we needed to do in order to meet everything else that we had set out. And why did we do it? <coughs> For people like Marilyn. Um, I don't know if you've ever been into a hospice, and <coughs> there's a really big part of me that wants to say I hope you never do, except death is pretty inevitable. And I hope that you do actually have contact with the hospice because if you do, it means you or that family member or that person you care about is going to have the best care possible. I think most patients probably think it's pretty strange when you get to innocently meet the fundraising director walking down the hallway and she's something who wants to be your best friend. But it was because she was a really inspirational lady and I know that my hospice is now going to be there for everyone like Marilyn because of the change that we made to that lottery. That one small change will mean we're now bringing in, by the end of this financial year, nearly a million pounds from that one income stream. Of the seven million no cost from the hospice, that's pretty significant. So we'll be able to help people like Marilyn, and I hope that for you, whenever you're local, you need your local hospice, they'll be able to do the same thing. So if you take one thing away from me today in that challenging what you think, disrupting what you're doing and making it happen, what's that one small thing that you can do? One pounds to two, that's going to make a huge difference.
to the people that we set out to help. Thank you.